Welcome back to the 1090 Podcast. I'm here with Kyle, Brennan, mm-hmm. KB. Um, Arkansas, how long you lived here? My whole life. Born and raised. 37 years. Well, I lived, I lived abroad for about seven months and then here. I tried Tennessee. What, uh, you like living in Arkansas? Or oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm big on outdoors, so Arkansas is really the state you want to be if you're big on outdoors. Fishing. Like, Fishing, hunting, riding. We have side by sides. We ride side by sides. We play in the mud. We hunt hogs and deer and bear. The accent is palpable. <laughs> it's great. Well, th- I'm actually masking a lot of my redneckness. And really? it, it, gets, it gets worse. It's worse. <laughs> the tireder I get, the, har- the harder it is for me to mitigate the way I talk. And yeah. so when I get to that point, it gets pretty, it's a bad draw. Our Uber driver recommended catfish. Yeah. Is that a staple here? Oh, absolutely. Get the catfish. We've got 200 pounds of catfish in the freezer at the house. Really? Yeah. Um, Dude, I'm so sorry for what you've been through, dude. I uh, Usually in the intro, we read the obituaries. Have at it. And it's not easy. And usually when I read the obituary, the parent is like, man, I haven't read the obituary since the funeral or, or since I wrote it or since usually they don't usually the people who've lost a loved one don't write their own obituary at least I couldn't do it maybe they do well, we but sat, you but you wrote all three of these yeah so we sat down with the funeral director we went to Rush Funeral Homes uh, Rush Cornwell is probably one of the coolest people ever and uh, we went through the whole thing we wrote every bit of that yeah we uh, sat down and they asked me what I wanted it to say and there's still Murfreesboro where she's where she was born at uh, where she's from anyhow she wasn't born there but she was from there uh, they actually put it in the paper and I still can't bring myself to get a copy of the paper mm. the girl that ran the paper was a friend of my wife's and she's actually asked me 10 or 15 times she sent me messages asking me if I'd like a copy of it and I just I haven't been able to do it yet it uh it was rough yeah um I'm I'm good to read them. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to read Taylor's first. Go ahead. Is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> Taylor Ashton Brandon, age 28, of Russellville, passed away Monday, June 19th, 2023. She was born December 12th, 1994, in Conway, Arkansas, to Keith and Monica Howard Scott. She was a trained chef and caseworker for Arkansas Department of Human Services. Taylor loved to laugh, go hunting, and most of all, she loved being a wife and mother. She was preceded in death by two children, Olivia Harper Brannon and Jesse James Brannon, her grandfather, Gene Scott, and her great aunt, Lori Evans. Olivia Harper Brannon, age five weeks, Passed away Monday, June 19th, 2023. She was born May 15th in Russellville, Arkansas to Kyle Douglas Brannon and Taylor Ashton Brannon. Olivia was full of life. She loved her family and she loved being held and carried. She was preceded in death by her mother, Taylor, her brother, Jesse, grandfather, Emmett, and great-grandfather, Gene Scott. Jesse James Brannon, age 11, of Russellville, passed away Monday, June 19th, 2023. He was born April 20th in <clears throat> Russellville to Kyle Douglas Brannon and Michelle McCormick. Jesse attended the Cowboy Church, and he was a fourth grader at Pottsville Elementary School. He loved Legos, cooking, barbecuing, playing soccer. He also loved penguins. I didn't see that one coming. He was preceded in death by his sister, Olivia, his mother, Taylor, and uncle, uh, D. Bly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of, and then at the end of all of them, it just says visitations will be held 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Saturday, June 24th. At Cornwall Chapel. Um, <clears throat> dude, 
so I, I lost I lost my wife, Courtney, my son Riggins, my daughter Frankie, my brother Race, my nephew Ryder, July twenty fifth, two thousand twenty one. Um, you don't meet too many people that have experienced the same thing. No. Like and <clears throat> Just the, like, I just had to read three obituaries. And, like, it's just, it's like, there's another one and another one. Like, it's just so much. It's so heavy. I think for me, I don't, I'm three years removed. You're just a year removed from the day. Just that, a little bit over a year. That changed your life. And I know we have some differences, but, like, dude, is your head just spinning all the time? Like, do you just go from one to the next? Well. Like, how do you even? So here's the funny part about this whole thing. This is the way grief works. And this is the, the worst part about grief, period. And this is the part I try to get across to people all the time. It's never you're mourning the same person. You know how people say, oh, you're not over your wife. You're not over your kids. You're, not okay. you're never going to get over them. But it'll be like one day I'll be sitting there and I'll tell my phone. I'll say, hey, call. And I try to avoid saying wife Taylor because I put my, her name in there as wife Taylor. So if anything ever happened to me, because I always thought I was going to go first. So I always thought if something happened to me and they got in my phone, they would look for the person that said wife, and that was my wife. And when it happens, it sets you back. Or when we went to uh, we went to an aquarium one time after they'd passed and there was penguin exhibit. And I said, Jesse would love this. And then I, you have to stop and go, he's not here. Yeah. And then for my daughter, people, you'll walk past babies and hear them crying. And the first thing you snap to is, where's Olivia? And then you just, it's so weird. You're just hardwired for it. Yeah. You're hardwired for that pain. You you just automatically assume that they're there. We went out to ice cream right after they all passed away. And for the first time in 11 years, when I scanned the room for my kids, I my boy wasn't there. And I broke down. I I lost it. Yeah. I couldn't stand up straight all the way walking to the truck. And I'm telling you, some days it is just gut wrenching. The other days you're like, you know, one of these days I'm going to be there with them. But, you know, you can't check out now because you check out now, then do you leave everybody else behind? Yeah, then what's it all for? Exactly. Do you, I struggle with like, because they all, they all just died together. And so mm -hmm. one thing that gives, I get, angry and frustrated with is like i'm not even sure if the grief i'm feeling is for my daughter i'm not sure if it's for a son i'm not sure if it's for my wife i'm like i don't even know how to label it and for some reason that's so frustrating because when i meet someone else who lost a daughter or a son and they're I'm like yeah i know what that's like but like i kind of don't though I, do, do you, you know ever, what i mean do you ever catch yourself sitting in there and going Baby, I miss you. Then immediately feeling guilty because you didn't include everybody else in the situation. Oh my god! I do this yes. a lot. I've got a teddy bear that's got some of their ashes in it that I got from my youngest son, and um, I'm sitting there sometimes, and I'll pick it up and go, "Baby, I miss you so much," and I'll be crying, and I, I go. I bet, then I immediately follow it up with, "I, I miss y'all too." Yeah, I haven't thought of Jesse <laughs> or like or like I do it. It's, it's torture. It is. I was writing. A, I was writing a, like a letter. Uh, for Riggins for his birthday because it's like an anniversary of his birthday oh, or whatever. Birthdays. And at, to start the letter, you'll un you'll understand this perfectly, but to start the letter, I'm like, Courtney, I love you. Frankie, I love you. Race, I love you. Ryder, I love you. But I just need to talk to Riggins right now, guilt-free. Mm -hmm. I've done I'm that. just going to talk to him because like you just have to or else like you just, you have guilt about how you're grieving. Like, am I doing it equally? Am I giving everyone enough sadness and heartache and pain type of thing and it's just like a mind fuck let me honestly. tell you another one that'll that'll really bother you i did birthdays for each of them except my daughter because i knew what my boy liked i knew what my wife liked but i never got to know what my daughter looked like what she liked what she was going to be who she was going to be five the things weeks. she'd be interested in i didn't know i was five weeks old i know she's five weeks it's not I even your fault i like, didn't know uh, it was a year a one year birthday, her one year birthday. I want to do this big one year bash, but what do you do? Would she have liked pink? Would she have liked purple? Did would she have liked to smash a cake open? Honestly, I thought about taking a uh, a cake and throwing it off a dam. Like I didn't know what to do. Yeah, I get that too. Because my son Riggins was almost six. He was a week away from turning six. 
So I have more, I just have more memories with him. I, he was, I was with them longer. My daughter, Frankie was two. And I do the same thing. Like I know more about Riggs and everyone else. And I mm-hmm. just, there was so much that Frankie didn't get to that I feel like I don't have that part to mourn. So like with Frankie, a lot of my grief is just anger that she died so little. Like she didn't even get a chance. Yeah. It- the the one thing that bothers me is people always ask you that question. If you could bring one of them back, which one would you bring back? Oh, no one. Because then you that, have to but... go through a whole situation. Because then you're you're you run into this rabbit hole of, do I bring back my wife? Do I my son? You know, he was eleven. He had friends. Do I bring back my daughter? She didn't have any life. Like, you know, and that that question's I get asked that question almost weekly. Yeah. If you could bring back any one of them, who'd you bring by? Who would you bring back? Who would you who'd you want to be with you? And I'm like, what are you doing at this point? You know, and other times you'd be like laying there in the middle of the night and you'll have a dream about them and you wake up thinking they're there. Like I've, they say if you have a dream about them, that's them. Yeah. And I've only had three dreams with them in it, period, since they've passed. And uh, of course, you always have that reliving that day. I can tell you every single thing I did that day. I can tell you every step I made, every every everything I said, every thought I had, I can tell you everything about that day. You asked me what I had for dinner last night, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. But that day, I remember everything. See, what's unique about it is, and I, I've, I've followed your situation because I actually heard your situation right after this whole thing. What was unique about mine is my wife and my, and my son were killed on impact. They died on impact. They didn't, there was no ever a breath, never nothing. And the truck driver that stopped there, and I'll tell you that a little bit later, but the truck driver stopped there told me a whole bunch of stuff, and he kept telling me things I didn't want to hear. But my daughter didn't die there. I had to go to Children's Hospital. The cop rushed me to Children's, and I held my daughter while she died in my arms. So I had to go through a hell that I promise you I never wish anybody on this earth to go through. And I'm sorry if hell is a bad word here. But um, what I went through in the hospital, I went through every stage of grief before my daughter died. I went through the begging stage, the pleading stage, the promising God everything in the world. I will do anything you want me to do. Just let her stay. Give her a chance. The doctors wouldn't do anything. They would not. They're like, we can't do anything. She's Her brain's gone. There's nothing we can do. But when I got there, when I ran up to the room and I got in the room and I put my hand on her head, her eyes moved a little bit inside of her eyelids. And the doctor said, that was the most movement she's had. And so when they picked, they picked her up here in my lap. They kept wanting to unhook, unhook her for everything. And I kept thinking, no, if they don't hook her, she won't, she won't go. But I begged and pleaded and promised God. I told him I'd do anything there was. I begged. Like, Everything you could possibly say. The bargaining stage. Oh, it was. I pleaded with God running to the wreck to not let this happen. You know, you can't do this to me. You can't do this to me. But when I was at the hospital, it was a whole nother level. At that point, I would have went. I would have given my life in two seconds and I wouldn't have thought twice about it. The bargaining stage is like a dream because when the dream ends and you wake up, it you see how ridiculous it is. Like it didn't even make sense. But, like, when you're in it, it's very real. And that's bargaining. Like, it's so real when you're in it. Like, this bargaining that you're pouring out with all your heart and soul. And then, like, when you get out of it and you, you kind of get in the ebbs and flows of acceptance. You, you start thinking, what was like, I thinking? Like, how, like, what was I even, like, it's, what, how, yeah, like, it's impossible what I'm asking for. But it, it, it's just slipping away from you. And you're just like, I'll do anything to get them back. But then after it's over, you start thinking, there's whole countries of people dying. Why am I any different? Yeah. Like, see, everybody always asks that question, why me, why me, why me? And that's the question everybody asks. Well, why not me? Why couldn't it happen to me? It can happen to anybody. Why, why couldn't it be me? And that was the whole thing. I got a question for you. How long did it take you to come to acceptance that it wasn't a dream? Oh, man. I, I still have that a little bit. I still think I'm going to wake up any yeah. moment. I heard a story the I other day. I have some days. I'm like, maybe, maybe I'll wake up. <laughs> well, there was a story the other day. This guy fell and hit his head in football. And he had a whole life. Ten years. Got up and he's fine. Everything was good. Whole life. And then all of a sudden, he went to sleep and he woke up in the helmet. He was still in the, he was still at the game. Ten years worth of life. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. I've thought about that every day since I heard that story. Have you ever... Uh, I remember like right after an accident, someone would walk through the door. And I'd see. Oh, you'd think it's them. I would. I would see Courtney's face on them, mm-hmm. or I'd be like, "Oh, that's Courtney." You know? And then or if I'm they like, wear anything it looks like, yeah. Or like my phone ring. Oh, that's that. I'm like, oh, oh. My wife every day would come home with that fail, 
and my son had been in the living room. She'd run up to him. She'd go, hey, baby. You know, just so, my wife was so energetic. You know those moms that you see get down the floor and play the games with their kids and just yeah. always playing with the kids? That was my wife. She was so energetic. She spent every moment of her life trying to be happy. And I see I see that, you know, people do that. Like her mom, when I go see her mom, I cannot stand being there. I love her mom. Her mom's a good person. But her mom acts and moves and talks the same way she does. I had this problem too. And it's just like it's I love so hard with my mother in law, Marsha. Like I love being around you because you remind me of Courtney, but I hate it too. Like I, I like it sucks because like it just makes me miss her so bad. I can't go to her grandma's house. I still haven't been there. Yeah. We spent a lot of time there. We're hunting and stuff down there. Spent a lot of time there. And no matter, you know, what happens between, you know, anybody in this family, that house is going to be the hardest to walk into. See, like coming up here, it kills me because Hertz Donuts is not three blocks from here. So Hertz Donuts is where me and my wife, we used to go all the time. We used to go to Brewski's and go drink at Brewski's. Well, she'd drink. I'd watch. I don't drink. But then we go, we hang around over here. We park in this parking mall over here. We go to, we go to uh, the donut shop over here. And Hertz was one of them places. We just loved coming up here. We'd always get a dozen donuts for the kids. And this is just, we met uh, over, she lived over there off Congo Road, just not even, what, 10 miles from here. And yeah. that's where she was from. And we rode around in my truck all the time together in South Arkansas is where we always went. And I can't even bring myself to go down there. I go to Granis, Arkansas every morning. And if I have to go over to Nashville, over by Murfreesboro, where her grandma's from, I lose my I lose my cool. I can't, I can't do it. I'll yeah. cry all the way home. Yeah, I remember, because... <laughs> Yeah, you you love them. You're with them for so long, and you have all these memories of them, and then they're gone, and then you drive past it, or you, yeah, and well, it I just think hits you. I think it's on this fact. I think my brain is kind of rationalized. She's just at home over there, and so I don't want to go over there because if I go over there, it makes it real. And so I have these ways of just kind of coping with the situation. See, that's why talking's hard. <laughs> that's why people don't want to talk because even though it's real, if you don't talk about it. It's kind of like oh yeah, but once you talk about it, it makes it really real and unbearable and. But that's why you keep doing it. You keep so talking I had about my life better. saved by two people, and believe it or not, you were one of them. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But there was a preacher that the funeral director gave me his phone number. He had lost his wife and two kids. He went through the same exact situation. Happened the same way. His wife had a a, a stroke and hit hit a uh, guardrail. And my wife had a uh, aneurysm or a seizure. We're not we're not sure which one. And she hit a tree. But the um, he told me one day, he goes, talk about it. He goes, don't ever stop talking. The more you talk, the better you'll feel. Just keep talking. And so I created my TikTok for that that whole situation. As I, I centered it around them. I centered it around that loss and letting people see what life is like after you do that situation. What happens? And I'm going to be honest with you. Half the time on there, I try to be as real as I can be. But half the time on there, I watch videos back. And I'm like, I'm feeling way worse than that. You know, and it's just, yeah. it, 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 it knocks you down. And then. Right afterwards, this probably wasn't four days afterwards. I was sitting there, I was praying. I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I was sitting there, I started swiping through my phone. So I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to look at my phone. Because I kept burying myself in videos, and then yours come across. And I cried like a baby. I, You were talking to some guys on there, and you were telling them about the story. And you were telling them about how you were you were hoping that it wasn't, like you were, you were, you were going to say it was your brother, and you said if you, your brother always survives everything, and you said it's just if if he's brought out, if it's him, then my whole family's gone, and that's exactly what I thought. Because when I was sitting there and I was talking to her on the phone, on the way back to the wreck, I'm like, Becky, you need to get over there, and they wouldn't let her close. She was like 100 yards away, and uh, I'm running back with everything I got. I'm, I'm hurrying as fast as I can get there, and Becky's on the phone. She's like, and see, at first when the wreck happened, I didn't think that nobody got hurt because I'm sitting there going. Oh, well, you need to call the insurance and get this and this. She's going to need a new car, all this stuff. I thought, because my wife had, had several wrecks because she was a terrible driver. But <laughs> she wasn't terrible. It was everybody around her. She just had the worst luck. The, the wrecks weren't even really her fault. It was just always worse luck. And so Becky tells me, she goes, she's trying to get answers. And I'm thinking my whole family's gone. I'm just like, they're, they're gone. This is it. Because it's bad. When she sees it, she goes, it's bad. And when you tell me it's bad, I'm already thinking the worst. I'm like, they're gone. They're absolutely gone. And Becky goes, and they said the the small child in the front seat and the woman driving are gone. And I went, oh, my God. I said, what about my daughter? I'm trying to think of everything else. And I'm breaking down, and I'm, I'm losing every bit of what I've Dude, got. this is me. Dude. It's like everyone's dead except one person, and I'm like. And they, they said that the, the med back started coming, and I'm talking med back after med back after med back just. Land, 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 land. Pick them up and go. Pick them up and go. 
And anybody that ever tells you they can outrun a med back to the hospital, no. I was 27 miles from them. They took off from Little Rock, Arkansas, landed in London, Arkansas, and were back in Little Rock before I ever got to the wreck. That's huh. 15 minutes because I was moving it. And uh, I got out of the truck, and I, I thought, I'm going to run up to them. No, you don't have any leg power. Walking was all I could do. Couldn't feel anything. I was just like, my whole body's numb, and I got this tingling feeling running through my whole body, and everything's running through my head. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then the pop, thought pops in my head, I'm done. I'm checking out as soon as I get home. As soon as this is over with, I am done. If this is not a dream, I am done. And this is the thought process I have for the longest time. Well, I get up there. Everybody says, oh, you're going to push through a cop. No, you're not. You can't even, you have no energy. I fell to my knees and I started crying. I begged God. I'm like, please let everybody else be okay. Please have somebody help them. I'm not doing this. And the cop says, your family's at the hospital. We have, your your kids are at the hospital. I had my older son and my middle son and then my my daughter was at the hospital. And I'm like, okay, what about my youngest daughter? And he goes, it's not good. And that situation... That's hard. <laughs> I, uh, we've kind of been talking about the day of and lots of different angles. Mm -hmm. Can we just, let's get, wake up the day of. Can you just walk us through it step by step? So this is very interesting. So I get up. Okay, I never call into work. I don't call in. I don't, I don't take off. That's not a thing. I don't do it. That day I got up on Monday and my wife was, my daughter was starting to cry because that night when going to bed, I tried to sleep with my daughter because my son, he gets jealous. And so that morning we woke up, I've got my daughter and I'm holding her and my wife comes up to me and I go, this is the, this is the last moment of this for the rest of our lives. And I didn't know how real that was going to be because we'd heard this deal. It's like, today is the last day your kid's going to be the way they are right now. They come up, yeah. they say something. It's the last day they're going to say it that way. This is the last time. Kind of like the it. whole, uh, the, I think it's a Buddhist quote, like you'll never Step into the same river twice. Yes. Like you'll never be the same person so, type of thing. We were sitting there and I was holding it and I kissed her and I told her, I said, I love you more than anything in the world. I, I was always real big about telling my wife how much I loved her. I wanted her to know. I said, you're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and I love you. And then my body kept saying, just call into work. Don't go. Don't go. And I had this feeling. I was like, something's wrong. Don't go. But I went anyhow. And I left for work. And my wife always brings me lunch in Dardanelle, which is only like 10 minutes from my house. So she always brings me lunch there. And for some reason, we couldn't get it lined out and I was like don't bring me lunch just stay home I thought something was wrong I had some feeling something was wrong but then we end up talking we was talking about Juneteenth and all this stuff and then we get I get over the plant and she brought me lunch to the plant she brought me a pizza and she was sitting there waiting on me and I pulled in and I usually just take the pizza and say hey I love you I'll talk to you later I didn't do that so I actually we would talk all day long on the phone so I actually took the pizza I got out I gave her a hug told her I loved her told my boy I loved her and he goes I love you dad he's got this draw like uh -huh. dad I wonder where he got that from yeah he goes he goes I love you dad and he's like uh -huh. joking around playing the seat and then everybody was awake and everybody told me they loved him except my daughter she was and like, this, is this normal conversation or we never did like this. you never did. we always told him I loved him before I left the house right. or something like but that not, when I was, see him yeah this was different I usually yell out the window I love you so something was totally off the situation and my body kept saying Kyle go home just, just put the truck down and go home. Just go park it. Tell your boss you're going home. And I almost did. I almost did. So we end up leaving there. And I go drop my trailer, pick up my new trailer, and I'm leaving out because I drive a truck. So I was leaving out. And we get almost to Ozark. And I tell her, I say, hey, babe, I love you a lot. My buddy's calling me. I need to talk to him for a minute. I hung up the phone, got on the phone with him. And then my phone immediately says, call Taylor. She's been direct. Just instantly. And I said, okay. Hung up the phone. Start calling my wife, calling my wife, calling my wife. Hammering it. Time after time after time after time. Even though you know they've already wrecked. Who messaged you that said they're... The iPhone. iPhone has a crash detection. Oh, whoa. Well, well. iPhone's the best thing ever. It's crash detection. Okay. I can tell you the moment her heart stopped, it's on her watch. The moment her heart stopped, it just stops. But I knew something. I knew that moment when that happened, I knew she's gone. I just knew it. I had a feeling. I was like, it's like the whole way to the world went, Kyle, she's gone. And it just, the, everything felt differently. Everything just was different all of a sudden. And I turn around, I whip the truck around, and I am flying as fast as I can. I actually went over one of those spots where you're not supposed to cross the highway. <coughs> and I'm like flying the other direction as fast as I can get there. And I'm, oh, I cannot tell you. I had fallen away from God at this point, and I had lost a lot of what I had. And I was praying, and I was crying, I was screaming. I'm like, 
don't do this to me. You cannot do this to me. Don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. And I've always kind of talked to God like he's my best friend, but at this moment, I just kept getting the sense over me. Becky needs to get there. And we kept talking back and forth on the phone. I'm like, you have to get there. And she And Becky's well, a Becky's a friend of the roommate. Your roommate. She's my wife's best friend. And um uh, when I pulled up to the the wreck, like I'm passing people on the shoulder. I'm trying to get there. And I seen the car. And the windows in the back were busted out when my kids climbed out. And I'm thinking that was first responders. And they had it tinted off and stuff all and over. You don't it. know, you don't know <laughs> any info yet. You just know I don't know anything at this point. I just action. know. When I pulled up the wreck and I seen the car, I said they're all dead. My mind went, there's no way nobody survived. Like the, it looked that. It looked, did you see the car? I did, yeah. Uh, my TikTok video where I showed the car shows the extent of how bad that was. Yeah. That that situation, that car is a whole different, whole different subject. But when I seen that, I was like, yep, this is it. Like your whole life changed. I knew it. I knew that moment. If nobody had survived that wreck, I wouldn't have made it ten feet. That'd have been the end of end of everything. And I. I Say all the time that there's a reason God spared my kids, some of my kids, is so I would live. Because if they weren't here, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. Is See, you know, here's the thing about this though. The day before the day before we talked about taking my son out of daycare. And my youngest son, Lane, wasn't supposed to be in that car. Was supposed to be in that car. He was supposed to be there. And she took him to daycare that morning because Olivia was fussy. I I don't even I can't even explain to you how much. Because she's like, I think we need to leave him there. I have a feeling we need to leave him there. She kept telling me that. I was like, okay, let's just do one more week. We had a full talk about this. He wasn't even going to go. And he wouldn't have made it. His car seat was unrecognizable. My son was in the back. He's 250 pounds. He fights putting the seatbelt on. He hit that seat at 70 miles an hour. Like he would have, it would have ended my son. Yeah. The seatbelt was so tight and it wasn't even latched. It was so tight you couldn't move your hand behind it. Yeah, you had six kids, mm -hmm. lost two, and you think, I mean, your four kids, is that the main reason you keep going? Or? That is the only reason. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, and there is no doubt, not, not, not a single ounce of my soul tells me this ain't true. There is no doubt if I, lose, if I had lost one more kid than what I did, I wouldn't have made it. If I had lost Lane, which is the last piece of her I had, I'd been done. Like, they're the only reasons I'm still here. And, you know, I went through this grief cycle for a long time, but I actually sat down with the band teacher for my son, and he told me some of the stuff my older son was going through. My older son's Eli. And Eli, the stuff that he told the band director, I didn't even know he's seen. See, Corbin, my 13-year-old, said he put his arm over his sister when the wreck happened. He seen her asleep, and he's like, oh, she slept through it. He tried to protect her. It's the reason he broke his arm. Like, there's trauma that I'm never going to understand from them. And they were in the wreck. And I'm sitting over here feeling selfish because I felt bad. I'm <laughs> That trauma just never goes away. It's something that is always with them. Eli woke up one night screaming and crying, coming to the bedroom. He said he had a dream he was still in the car. I mean, how do you, how do you recuperate that? How do you fix that? Because as a dad, we always pride ourselves and be able to fix any situation. You, this is a situation so beyond what you can fix, it's not even funny. And as a dad, like, you have this feeling that you know, you're the protector. Like, you don't let yes. anything happen to your wife and kids. And oh, so I you, felt like an utter failure. Yeah, you just, you hate yourself. There is no doubt. I tell everybody all the time, I'm fat, old, and ugly. And, I, and then they say, well, at least you're a great dad. I said, no, I'm a horrible dad. I couldn't protect my kids the one time they needed me. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm straight up real about it. There's no way. I I feel like an absolute failure. My kids needed me. They were screaming for me after that wreck. They were screaming for me. And I wasn't there. I wasn't able to get to them. Yeah, that haunts me at night. <sighs> I mean, I, when I talk to my kids, that's what I tell them. Like, I'm sorry. I wasn't there. There's a million things that I worry about. Like, I could have told my boy Jesse what to do in case of a wreck. Never thought of that. We didn't plan anything. We didn't know anything. You know, going to the funeral... The thing about the funeral, which always got me, is I didn't know anything my wife wanted. We never had this conversation. We never did. We had, we, I tried to one time because I know what I wanted. I've known forever what I want happen to me. But my wife never told me what she wanted, so I didn't know. So I went into this whole thing thinking, you know, doing exactly what I wanted, but I hoped that she was happy with what I did. I'm sure she was. 
is. I don't know. My wife was pretty much happy with everything I ever did, but she don't understand. She was the only reason that I was ever I ever existed. That woman was amazing. You know, I, <laughs> I did want to talk about this about how because I I get you know people asking like wow like how like how are you doing this like type of thing and honestly it's the it's the people I lost like if you would meet my wife oh, you'd get it you'd get the way I, like it would make more sense my wife was the best she like she just wanted to help people she was a nurse like she just and same with my kids same with my brother like so I think that meant like the type of person you lose I think that does influence the grief to some degree so. This is, okay, let me tell you about my wife. My wife, yeah, she was young. But my wife had already been an athletic trainer in her life. She had won multiple cooking championships. Like, she'd went all around, won trophies everywhere of cooking. She had chili. It was amazing. Man, a, a, a wife that can cook. Like <laughs> My wife my wife couldn't just cook. My wife could do things like Gordon Ramsay. I mean, she'd cook dinners, and you're like, mm. how do you make that? Well, then she went to be an athletic trainer, and then she always wanted to be a chef. It's her thing. She went to be an athletic trainer to make her dad happy. And she said that after a few years of working her butt off for nothing, she didn't make any money. She wanted to go be a chef. She went to be a chef. Then they put her as the PA, the the receptionist, whatever. But she pretty much ran the whole school. She went around the school and did everything there was. She was the hardest worker you'd ever meet in your life, and she had a passion that you couldn't imagine. And then she decided she wanted to work with kids, and she went to go be a DHS caseworker, which is, in my opinion, one of the hardest jobs you could ever yeah. do as a person. Because my wife loved kids that much. My wife stepped into a role. She took on a man and four kids. At and she, she was 25 when we met. She took on a man with four kids, and she was perfectly fine with it. Like, we had a little bit of a rough start when we first got together, but I'm telling you right now, I've never been with somebody that within three days you're trying to tell her you love her. Because I avoid that word at all costs. Mm. I can count on one hand everybody ever taught I love them. That's counting family. I'm... I'm I don't even tell my mom I love her. But my wife got that within three days. Yeah. There's just something about that. You just can't. You cannot fathom how much love I put in a woman. I would have done. I would have moved the moon. I taught her all the time. I'll move mountains. You just pick the mountain. That's all I need. You pick the mountain. We'll figure it out. I think that's what makes. I, there's so much anger and grief because like you would, but there's nothing you can do. The like anger there's is nothing funny. you can do. So then you're just so mad. Like, well, the anger is funny because it's not directional anger. You have nowhere to where you have no idea where to put it. You get mad for no reason, and you're sitting there going, "Why am I mad? What am I mad at?" Like you want to put that anger somewhere, but there's no real anger. It's just you're mad at yourself. You're like, "Why wasn't I there? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I fix this? Why didn't I stop them?" And I tell people that, and they're like, "They don't make any sense." Right. You don't understand the anger isn't the even, anger doesn't care. Yeah, it doesn't it need to make sense to the anger guy. But you the anger care. turns into crying immediately. The yeah. anger is what turns into all the heartbreak and the crying. See, I tell people all the time, that's not the thing you need to be worried about. The anger. It's not. It's the forgetting. It's the forgetting they're gone. Mm. At the moments that you think that you need them the most, you're like, I wish they were here. I wish this was this. And you, you bring them up. And I try to keep them in conversation because when you bring them up, one thing that they loved then you lose everything. You're like, oh my God, they really love that. I need to, I need to figure out how to preserve that. And then yeah. also the 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 part about not knowing what to do with their stuff. This is the hardest part I've ran through so far. What do you do with your stuff? Like I don't want to let any of it go. I don't want any of it to go anywhere. I know people want stuff for theirs, but I don't want to let it, anybody touch it. All their stuff is packed up in my in-laws' basement still. I'm, Everything's exactly how ha- they left it. Haven't been able to go through it yet. Everything's exactly how they left it. Except my son. I had to redo their bedroom because my older kids destroyed the bedroom. But my wife's stuff is exactly where it hung. The only thing I did is I put like three coats and some blankets of hers in a tote. And I felt like crap after I did that. The guilt, man. Like, it just... It won't, I feel like they're going to come home and be up. mad. I feel oh, like they're going to be mad. I feel like they're going to come home and be mad. Yeah, I remember <laughs> after the accident first year, I'm just numbing it. So alcohol, weed, like whatever. Like, I can't deal with this pain. And I remember, I think I was taking Blue to kindergarten, maybe, and I see this kid with a PJ Masks backpack. And my son, Riggins, loved PJ Masks. And so, like, I see it. And then I my my impulse is just to, like, change the subject, think about something else, avoid it. And in that moment, I'm like, okay, if I do this, is what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to, and this is what you said, I'm just going to forget them. I'm going to forget about all the good things, all the qualities they have. If I run from the pain, I'm going to run from all the love and all the memories we had. And so then I, I started to learn in my grief that like the place of healing and gratitude is in the same place as the hell and the anger and the pain. And you got to, you got to go through one to get the other type of thing and the grief. And it took me so long to do that. With you, I want to get back to the day of. So you mm -hmm. roll up on the scene. You think everyone's dead. You fall to your knees. Can we get back there? Well, that's the interesting part because that's the only part of the whole situation. I don't remember. I don't remember how I got from there to the cop car. Then I went to we went to St. Mary's. My son was at St. Mary's, my oldest son. And the cop's trying to explain to me everything. He's, he's taking me around because, trust me, he didn't want me to drive at this point because I would never made it to the hospital. I'd been done before I got there. So he took me to the hospital, and then I had to tell my boy, I was like, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He's crying. He broke his uh, he broke his neck, and he broke his back in three different places. He broke his arm. This is my oldest son, Eli. He was in the very back seat. He was in the very back driver's he was, side. He was 11. No, he he, he was, was, uh, he was 12. He was 12. Or no, he's 13. He's 13 years old. Sorry. Uh, Corbin was 12. Anyhow, we're at the, we're. At the hospital, and he's crying, Dad, Jesse, Dad, Jesse, Dad, Jesse. And I just walked out of the room and just fell to the floor. I was like, I can't do this. They don't ask me to do this because I can't do it. You know? And at that point in time, I'm like, okay, as soon as I get everybody home, I get everybody sorted, I'm going to send them their prospective places, and I'm done. I'm checking out. I am I'm, I'm, I had a full game plan. Like, I had, I had figured out exactly how I was going to do it. I was going to write a note, put it out. I had it planned out. So, yeah. And then I'll get back to that part in a minute. But anyhow, the cop says... Um, I got a call from the hospital, and the, about the same time, the cop came up from Children's in Little Rock. And they said, hey, you need to get here fast. I can't do anything until you get here. And I said, you do whatever you got to do. You save her life. I don't care. And I said, you save all my kids, because I didn't know any situation of my kids. So get in the cop car. He goes and gets gas, which I was infuriated by. I can't even tell you how mad that made me. But I understood. We weren't going to make it there. I get about to Conway, not too far from here in the Doctor calls me and said, hey, my name's so-and-so. I'm the neurosurgeon here, and your daughter's brain dead. That's exactly how I said it. I'm the neurosurgeon here. Your daughter's brain dead. We'll keep her comfortable till you get here, but I would like permission to go ahead and pull the plug. And I said, no. I said, you're going to wait until I get there. I said, you wait. Cop, he's flying. We get there, and we come to the door. And I run up to the room immediately, and the nurse met me at the door. She's running with me to the room. And she goes, okay. Yeah, the kids are okay. You're Corbin's in surgery, which is my 12-year-old. He said, You're, he's in surgery. I said, okay, what about my daughter? She goes, she's got a broke sternum. I said, okay, immediate thing is the youngest kid that's hurt the most. So I run to Olivia. I get from here to the corner over there from this door, and there's a little sliver of the deal, and I can see her laying on the bed. And my whole body goes, I got to get to her. And I ran to the bedside, and I, I got down on my knees. I put my hand on the floor, and I said, it's okay, baby. Daddy's here. It's okay. Daddy's here. And, uh, she moved her eyes a little bit. And the doctor looked at me and goes, that's the most movement she's had. And I think she waited for me to say goodbye. I think that's what she's waiting for. Because I didn't get to tell her I love her that day she's asleep. So I think she was waiting on that. I held her for two hours. My daughter took her last breath at 320. I held her when she took it. I told her I was there. And uh, she took her last breath. They took everything out of her. And I, I held her for a little while. And uh, they had me put her down because they were going to take some like footprints and stuff. And so I went to see my other kids and checked them out. As soon as I made sure this was okay, I told my 12-year-old, or my 13-year-old, Eli, I said, I walked in the room and I said, uh, Jesse's gone. I said, I'm sorry, but Jesse's gone. He said, what about Taylor? I said, Taylor's gone. Because they seen it. They, I didn't know they'd seen her, but she was gone when they were there. And I said, I'm sorry. And he's like hugging me and telling me he loves me and all that stuff right here. And, First time I told my son, and my son told me, he said, I don't want to be here no more. And hearing that out of your kid, I said, we can't do that. Well, then after that, nurse came back down and got me, and he said, I said, what do you want us to do? And I said, I'm coming back up there. And I went and held my daughter for an additional hour and a half. I held her. I rocked her and told her I'd be there with her soon. I still feel like a failure for that one, too. But I told her, I said, I love you. I'll be theirs. Be there as fast as I can get there. I got to take care of your siblings first. Well, then we ended up having to stay the whole night. And God knew because I said, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going home. I'm done. So I, I feel like my testimony to God is unbelievable. 
He pulled me out of this, but I told him, I said, I'm just going to get everybody situated. Well, they wouldn't let Eli go. I had to stay all night with him. So I slept on the floor, the chair. It was horrible. Next day, we get to go home, and we're in the deal, and they hand me these clay molds of my daughter's feet and handprints, which is so ironic because her first ones are hanging right next to her last ones. And it's all within two months. So I get home, and my thought was I'm going to go in the house. I'm going to tell Becky to take the kids to go get ice cream. I'm going to take my shotgun. I'm going to the backyard. We're going to call it quits. Had a chair deal. I had a text message text out on the phone that says, don't come home, call 911. I went out there. I tried to go to the bedroom and then her and my boy beating on the door. And I never told anybody this. But they was beating on the door. My son goes, hey, Dad, I love you, Dad. I love you. And all the way through the hospital, he was playing on the floor. And I sat there and hinged the bed. And I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I told him, I said, they leave in 10 minutes. We'll call it good. And I kept saying, oh, Beck, it's okay. Just go. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to take a nap. And so I sat there on the edge of the bed. And I'm holding her shotgun. And hanging. I'm like, I heard my son yelling outside. And I kept feeling this feeling, hey, you just need to go out there and hold your boy. So I said, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. I put it put it away. And I walked in the bedroom. And I walked in the living room. And I picked up my boy. And I held my boy flow. And I just broke down crying. So the next day of this, I go to, uh, there's a lake at um, Pottsville, it's a reservoir. It's the last place me and my wife went before she died. And it's so funny because I had the worst, I had the best Father's Day I've ever had in my life the day before she died. Just, we go back to the lake. I told God, I said, look, I'm going to give you a chance. I said, you send me three signs telling me I need to be here, and I'm here. And I come up with, I could not find I, I, there was things that she had been missing that I, I didn't see yet. One was her cell phone, and I didn't know about anything else. So I left there, and I go down to the wreck site where it all happened. And I comb around, and I couldn't find anything. So she had been I, missing. Like, I'm a big believer to just <laughs> let people talk and yeah, try not to. But, like, the, 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 going, back to, it's hard. going back to the wreck mm-hmm. is usually a big deal for someone's grief journey. Maybe... A year later, a couple years later. It was the first thing I did. Maybe they bring... Yeah. And so I, I think it needs just to be mentioned. Like, this is a... And you're in shock, which maybe you've helped you. But still, like, this is not normal behavior for someone who's gone through something like you have. Oh, I spend a lot of time at that wreck. So anyway, yeah. So you get, you get back to the wreck. Sorry. So I go to the... Uh, I go back to the wreck, and I'm trying to find her sunglasses, her driver's license. And her and uh, her hat, because she had a hat that her brother had lost on a boat. And I had searched forever to find one. It was a limited edition Nike hat. It's camo. It's one of one. There's none of them out there. And I found one. And it cost me a fortune to get that hat, but I wanted her to have it. And so my thought process was I'm going to be as close to him as possible. So I go back to the wreck, and I start gathering up anything I can find. And I'm talking. I found an AirPod. I found all kinds of stuff. And so I'm standing on the side of the road, and I can't find her glasses and her her driver's license, because I already got her wallet. They brought her wallet to me the day after the wreck. Like, the corner showed up at my house as soon as I got home. And I got her wallet, her cell phone, her watch. I didn't have her sunglasses, because they were a uh, coast of sunglasses, because only the best would ever work for her. I would only buy her the best. Yeah. And uh, so I said, okay. I need. I told God I got on my knees. I said, I know what I want. I want that hat. I want the sunglasses and her driver's license. If you can give me those three things. I thought the cop took her driver's license. He didn't. So... I'm sitting there. Now, the wreck is a tree that's laying down, and there's a bald spot of dirt right here, but they had hit the tree so hard they knocked the tree down. And the car stopped so abruptly that her two front tires went almost 100 yards past where the car went. Her headlights were on the other side of the tree. And I actually have a video of this, but her headlights were on the other side of the tree. It went further than the tree did. you have a video of the accident? I have a video of everything on the accident with the exception of the car there. Hmm. I got the news deal of that. But I got down on my knees in that dirt spot. Now, on my knees, dirt spot, there's nothing there. I told God, okay, these are the things I want. And I felt, look down. Her hat was sitting right there on the ground. Right below my knees. Okay, I'll give you this. So then I leave there, and I get a call immediately from Cogswells telling me, hey, we're the ones that took the car. We have it here. You can come by and see it anytime. And I said, okay, I'm going to see it right now. So I go to the car. 
probably the I would not recommend doing this. No, this would is, not. This is, just let this it go. Is don't look in it. Don't go to it. But I'm a very, I'm very much a connection person, and I wanted to feel a connection. So I go to the car. Nothing prepared me to see that car. There was no motor. There's nothing. The front end is. There's nothing. And I walk over. The guy let me around the car. I picked up a sledgehammer and I busted out every damn window because I couldn't fathom the fact there was windows left on this car. I busted out every window. Everything. Went through it and I got everything out of it I could get. And now, this is another one I ever told nobody. Her blood and stuff was in the seat of that car, in the front seat of the car. And I climbed through her blood to get her stuff. But I cleaned that car out. I got everything I could get. I couldn't get in the console. I couldn't get anything on the passenger side. And I said, okay, it's all I need right now. I stepped back out of the gate, and there's a church across the church on the same property. They own the property. And I said, okay, I'm going there Sunday. And so this is, you know, we're going, this is, happened Monday. This is Wednesday. I said, okay. So Thursday, I go back to that lake, and I sit there at that lake, and I'm just praying to God that, you know, he finds the way to give me some kind of peace because I need it because I wouldn't I refuse to drink I refuse to do anything else I didn't want to do anything that was going to be habit of forming because I'm I'm real bad ADHD so I'm real bad I, I, if I get hooked on something I'm hooked on it like I drunk sodas for this mind you I didn't eat for two weeks I don't know about you but I need for two weeks I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink if I drunk I'd throw up if I ate I'd throw no, up and it's it's like not even on your radar you don't like people would come up to me like you haven't eaten they kept stuffing yeah, food in my like, face like I I can't eat well, I kept telling God, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to end it tomorrow. End it tomorrow. And people kept showing up in my house. Nobody would leave me alone. Like, I got to a point. Like, I was I'm trying yelling. to kill myself. <laughs> well, you done. guys give me a minute? <laughs> Nobody would leave me alone. And I, I had a boss. His name was Roger. And so I lost like 11 people in my life in two years. And my boss, Roger, had shut up my house with his wife. And they kept going and getting groceries. They'd pay my bills. They'd do everything. They would not leave me alone. I love Roger. I miss him so much. He passed away not too long afterwards. And every day I'd plan something out and I'd tell God, okay, nobody's here. We'll do it now. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. All the time. Beating on the door. Slam the door. And I think Becky gave him the password to my door because everybody kept coming in the house. And I'm like, y'all got to quit. Like, y'all got to quit. My brother showed up. Now, what that infuriated me, going back to Part of you liked it, though. Going back to the hospital. Really, no, no, nothing really. You didn't it. love no, like the, no. the, 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 what, the so support. The I'm community? a hundred. Well, there wasn't really support. Let me explain why. My sisters and my brothers don't have anything to do with me. My older brother does. My other ones, they never talked to me. And they were at the hospital. Like, I got to the hospital and people were there that I haven't seen in years. We see them maybe once a year for like 20 minutes and I don't even like them then. And they were there. There are people there that I'm very impressed that were there. But some of my family is drama-oriented. So if you don't talk to them, they, they think that's a personal attack. And they don't realize after the wreck, before the wreck, before the wreck, I deal with a lot. After the wreck, I won't deal with anything. Just don't do it. You just don't have energy for it. Huh? No, I don't have any energy. If yeah, you start drama with me, I will block yeah. you, and I won't think twice <laughs> about it. There won't be no yeah. more thought. For, I don't care if I've known you my whole life. I don't care if me and you were best friends in high school, and you have been there for every hard moment of my life. You cause one ounce of drama, you're done. We, we're we gone. We're, I don't have time for it. There is there is no time in life. Okay? Today is the only day you're guaranteed, and you're only guaranteed it from now until you take your next step. That's all you're guaranteed. You could step out that door right now, and this building fall on you, and it'd be the end of it. Yeah, because your wife, she died. It was, do we know it was either a seizure or brain? It was a seizure and aneurysm. Okay, so she had had an epilepsy, but she hadn't had a seizure since she was 14 years old. Is I'm it, only going it, back this way because I'm trying to... No, pass. is it still a question mark or do you know? Well, it was, never, it was never figured out because an autopsy was almost $1,000. I'm not, we're not going that route because it didn't matter at that point. They were gone. It doesn't matter how it happened. They were gone. Yeah. Well, also, she had been having really bad headaches after my daughter was born. And they gave her a wristband, so if something happens, they would know to get them there. She had really bad headaches. I've been trying to convince her not to drive. I told her, I said, you need to stay home. You don't need to drive. I said, you don't know the situation you're going to be in. You know, you couldn't tell my wife anything. She was super mom. If she right. let anybody do anything, she felt like she was a failure. But I think, like, for me and you, like, I lost, like, a sandstorm is what caused the pileup mm -hmm. in my family's incident. Yours is a seizure. Like, so, like, 
you're when you say like you're only guaranteed today and you only get your next step, like mm-hmm. that's you, all you get. Like literally, like it could be a brain aneurysm. You can. I, I it talk, could be a sandstorm. I talked to a lady that lost her husband to an aneurysm. They were in the middle of an argument. Yeah, he just lights out, gone. And I told some I said, "There's no reason to argue. There's no reason for that." You love everybody the best you can do today. And I've gotten to where I tell people that I love them a lot more. If I know somebody that I, I really care about them, I tell them, say, hey, I care about you. And people around me don't know how to take it now. See, I had a buddy of mine that was, he's a really great guy. And he come mowed my yard and everything else kept showing up. He didn't know what to do. He wanted to do something. He didn't know what to do. And there's a lot of people that helped me out and stuff. And here's the thing that I hated, and this is going to sound really bad, but I hated this. Everybody kept giving me money. They kept handing me money. Now, don't get me wrong. I appreciated it because... Until you do something like that, you don't realize how broke you are. I don't care how much money you got. You don't realize how broke you are. Funerals cost a lot. Yeah. I mean, a lot. And do three at once. It's ridiculous. But people kept handing me money. I'm so sorry for your loss. They hand me this. And I, I, I honestly, at this point, I can't stand when people say, I'm sorry for your loss. I, I can't stand it. And there's reasons why. I mean, to me, I would rather you come and say, hey, what do you need help with? I know you've gone through a lot. I'll help you. That's what I like to hear. When it comes to you and say, I'm so sorry for your loss. If you need me, call me. And that bothers me too because you call them, they will never answer their phone. Yeah. They'll be like, that's Kyle calling. Nope. And there's been several times I've needed people to talk to and they're like, I'll reach out if you need me and I'll reach out to them and say, look, I'm having a bad day. Can we talk? Nothing. I've been blocked more times than not. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's interesting. You're talk- I mean, you talk a lot about being the moment and that's something that grief has really taught me too is, you know, really being the moment. But it's interesting because Grief takes you out of the moment more than anything. Like part of grief is thinking about the past you had. Grief just shuts you down. And part of grief is thinking about the future you were robbed of. So I'm big on forward progression. Like, right. So keep like moving forward. I just think it's interesting that like it gives you the gift of appreciating the present more than you ever could. But also your mind is going to try to not be in the present moment. Like it's a very weird yin and yang, well, at least for me anyway. Going back to the the whole church thing though. I went to church after the funeral. The funeral was on, I think it was on Saturday. It's it's hard to remember. I think it was Saturday. It was Saturday. At the funeral, I would be. I I made it a point. I was going to be the last person there. And so what I had done at the funeral is I knew that I was going to like break down. I knew at some point I was breaking down. Did you speak at the funeral? Yes, I did. And that's another thing I wish I hadn't have done. Hadn't have done? Hadn't done. Well, I wish I hadn't have talked. And why I'm, is that? Okay, so at the funeral, I picked something to do. My son had a bruise on his arm and I had his soccer ball. So I kept his soccer ball covered up, bruised up. And I kept straightening up his tie and moving his hair out of his eyes. And my daughter had this piece of hair sticking up so I move it down. And my my mom-in-law had done my wife's makeup, which really didn't kind of look like my wife, but you know, you know who it was. And I kept kissing my wife's forehead and I just kept, I kept being there for them. Wait, when sorry, I went, did you have an open casket? I did. Funeral? hmm I did. And um, I actually have those pictures and I have them locked away in an app that I don't touch and I've only opened that app one time. It's just, it's hard. You'll get there eventually, maybe one day or never. I, I hope I never yeah. get there. I, I really hope that I can remember them for who they were, not what they what that situation. But I knew that at some point I wanted those pictures. Yeah. Because I figured at some point my boy asked. But anyhow, so I got up there and I told like how amazing my wife was, how beautiful my daughter was. And I told a joke about my son because he wanted to barbecue really bad. So I bought him a barbecue grill for his birthday. His birthday was uh, 4 twenty twelve. So on 420, <laughs> yes. So on 420, I got him a grill, and he made pork chops. They were the worst pork chops you'd ever had in your whole life, okay? This is a joke I told. The worst pork chops you ever had in your life. They were burnt to a crisp, but I ate one. You're a good dad, man. You, you had to get one, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. That was it the took best every pork fiber chop in ever. my being to eat that pork chop and go, that is amazing, boy. He was so excited. He had a grill set and all this <laughs> stuff, and he was so excited. He was a little chef, and he wanted to be a chef when he grew up, too. Just like his mom. He was a kid's kid, though. He liked to play. And he was, you know, he was 11 years old. So he he liked to play still at school. So he got picked on a little bit for that. But he liked to play. And, you know, little kids can be mean. But they pick on him for playing because they want to play on their smartphones, their smart devices, and all this smart stuff. But Jesse was a kid's kid. He liked to, he liked to do things hands-on. Like, he would be out there playing with a the basketball. They could. And he didn't care. And uh, being how, after the funeral, I went to church on that Sunday. And I left the church, and I said, I'm going back to the wreck. And I'm praying to God. And now, mind you, the highway department had mowed this. They had mowed over all this. And I'm like, okay, I still haven't found our glasses. So I get back to the wreck. And I walk up to the spot. And I get down my knees again and start praying to God. I'm like, hey, God, look, I'm really needing you right now. 
And I felt this whole feeling. Just look to your left a little bit. And I looked to my left, right beside the dirt, and there's your sunglasses. Explain that one to me, because you can't, because I, I went over this a million times. I've never seen them. So I said, okay. I left there that day, and I go back to the wrecked car, and I look through the fence, and I just, I don't want to get close enough to it, but I want to see it. Because to me, it feels like they're still there. So I'm like standing there looking at it, and go back to the lake. And the next few days, it's just like me kind of moving around and trying to, trying to survive, trying to find something to give me a deal. So I post a video on TikTok, and it goes, mega viral and like I didn't know anything about TikTok this time I didn't know you can make money at this point right here, I still don't even know how to make money off of it but <laughs> it's kind of disastrous but I post this video and people just start sending donations and I realized Becky had made a GoFundMe and a bunch of other stuff and I started sending donations and I'm like what is going on you know and at this point I felt so alone because after it happens you don't realize how alone you are until everybody leaves and so I make this deal with God at the funeral and I say hey after I get everything done and I get the insurance check, and it wasn't much of a check. It was like a couple hundred bucks. Get the insurance check. I get their earns back and I get everything sorted out and I spread their ashes. I'm going to end it all. Well, then two weeks from that, they come. The ashes come. Everything's there. Everything's settled. Okay. So you're sitting there and going, okay. Well, I go to where I'm going to, you know, spread the ashes and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't do it. I can't. It feels like I'm letting them go if I do it. So they're sitting on my shelf at the house. They haven't moved. But I lost it that day. I mean, that day when I picked up those ashes, I lost it. And then about a month from that, it gets to a baptism. They're doing a baptism at church. And they had done one a long time. And I'm loving this church because everybody's so welcoming. And so I'm, I go to the lake and I pray to God. I say, God, look, if this is the right time for me to be baptized, show me this is the right time for me to be baptized and I will follow you to the end of the earth. And I get a call from Cogswell's Towing. Hey, we've moved this vehicle to our new lot, but we really got to do something with it. Can you please come clean it out today? So I go back to the car. I'm cleaning everything up. Her dadgum driver's license is sitting on the floor. I've already cleaned this out. I've cleaned this spot out. Her driver's license is sitting there. And so I go over to get baptized and get the baptized, you know, get that point. I'm standing in that deal and he's telling the story, you know, of why I said, hey, you know, you need to live your life and don't look back. And then I went down in the water and I come back out of it. And all of a sudden, that feeling of killing yourself is just gone. It's just like something grabs it in the water. I felt like he was trying to drown me. I was down there so long. But it was seconds on the <laughs> He's video. like, my prayers are answered. <laughs> You're killing me. This is great. He's going to drown like, me. <laughs> I felt like he was trying to hold me down under the water. But like, if you hey, watch the video, you, uh, it's literally like this. Can you baptize me? <laughs> <laughs> well, wink, wink, wink. If I could have paid him to do that at that uh, point, I'd probably have done it. But he, he just, in the video, he goes like this. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is amazing. And then he goes, do you want to baptize your boys? And look over, my boys are ready to get baptized. So I got to baptize my kids too. Now I'm going to tell you something. If you could feel somebody smiling from heaven, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you could feel her smiling because I felt like yeah, a what a, what a great thing your family needed, like this idea of like rebirth and and continuing forward, like such a... You know Beautiful thing to do after such a horrible thing. The weird part about the whole situation is the entire time I had a plan on how to end it. And you could just never get around to it. I never had the ability to do it. Well, the reason why is that preacher I was telling you about told me, he said, always do it tomorrow. He said, don't matter what happens to you today, do it tomorrow. Say, if you're going to kill yourself, say, I'll do it tomorrow. One day at a time. If you get to tomorrow, say, hey, I'll do it tomorrow. How's a... Uh... Not to change Go ahead. paths on you, but navigating so much grief with... Four kids. Oh my God, it's easy. It's That's easy. easy That's easy. That's part. not what I was expecting you, you to say. You don't say. understand. The they keep me so daggum busy. I haven't got three seconds myself. I you work, can't kill yourself. You I work seventy to seventy five hours a week. I don't have any free time. Yeah, I don't have any free time, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I strive on chaos. The more chaos is around me, the better I strive. How often do you guys talk about them? They won't open up. They won't. No, nope, I got him to open up twice, and I like to bawl my eyes out for three hours. I said, so Corbin will open up. He'll come talk to me about How it. How old a is he? he? He at the time he was twelve. He's thirteen now. Okay. So Corbin will open up a little bit. Aubrey opens up a lot. She talks all the time. My oldest boy's a finks. He's talked to one person since it happened, which I'm fine with that. I tell him to talk to whoever you want to. I waste tons of money on counseling, and they don't talk to a counselor. They won't talk to him. But now. Corbin came to me one day. He's like, Dad, I need help. And I tried to get him to open up to the preacher, and he wouldn't talk. He just shut down. But if you start bringing it up, now here's the part that I find the hardest. 
is trying to figure out how to navigate their emotions because I don't do anything quick. So afterwards, I bought a side by side. I started taking them riding. I figured I wanted to get them outside. So I used to be really worried about debt and stuff. I don't care about it anymore because <laughs> yeah. you don't know when you're going out. <laughs> yeah. And I'd rather go out with a million dollars in debt than go out debt free with nothing. Uh-oh. So I started taking them riding one day, and Corbin just started crying one day. We were out swimming. He was out in the water, and he started crying. He said, Dad, I just need a hug. I said, okay. Because he's been huggy a lot. He, he wasn't like that before. I said, okay. She started hugging me. He goes, Dad, I've seen it all. I've seen her. I've seen her. I've seen my brother. I've seen the blood. I've seen it all. And nothing on this earth as a father prepares you for that pain. Because it comes rushing back to you. And then you start realizing they're never going to they're never going to be the same kids they're never going to be my son will come in there and he'll see me crying cuz i try to hide it i i'm i'm really stupid when it comes to this i try to hide my pain yeah like i put on this persona as being the fun loving guy that likes to laugh and play and that's who i am and if dad's okay but, then i'm okay type of yeah. thought process and so i keep them happy but when i broke down in that room and eli come in there crying and hold me. He goes, I miss him. He goes, I, you think I'm crazy? You, you think I'll, uh, you call me crazy or whatever, but I miss him. When I cleaned out their bedroom, we cried. Everyone was crying. We couldn't quit crying. Like I held my boy's blanket forever. He has a Tigger teddy bear and I held it forever. And I mean, you can call me crazy, but I've slept with a teddy bear more nights than I haven't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, entering back into the world is the hard part. It, it, that situation, when I got back to work and I'm sitting in the truck, she's riding next to me in the truck, you know, just, Getting back to work and keeping yourself busy and stuff like that was probably one of the best things. But they didn't let me go back to work for a month. I don't know how. So you I wallered in the house all, for a dude. month. I wallered in the house for a month, just in this self pity situation where I could not pull myself out of it. And I'm sitting here and I just start thinking, you know, all of this stuff that happens to everybody in this world, and they keep moving. Why am I shutting down? And I start really starting to push forward, start trying to do stuff. I got out, started going riding, hanging out with the kids, doing things with them, taking them places. Now, the hardest part is still, to this day, I can't go in restaurants me and her ate in. Like, I go to La Hurtis in Russellville, which is my favorite place in the world to eat. And I keep going there. Me and wife went there all the time. I keep going there because it just makes me feel like she's there. And, like, I went into Chili's once. I can't bring myself to go in just about anywhere else. No. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been over a year. It's a year and about two months. And I'm still stuck in that rut. I don't know why. Well, you're a baby, dude. It's been a year. You got these new baby grief legs. You're learning to walk and how but to my be wife wifey. could deal with everything and keep moving forward. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm failing her. Yeah, I know that feeling very well. I feel like I'm failing her. And I've always had a love for cooking. See, that's like if I lay in bed all day, then I the grief or like the shame of like your wife would be like, get off your ass and go. I can hear her something. saying, "Yeah, why like, are you laying around? You're moping around. Like, so, get up and do something. Funny story about this. One night I was sitting there and I was, everybody kept talking about having dreams of their late husband and stuff like that because I joined a bunch of widowers groups and I was a big part of the widower community. I, I endowed myself in it really bad. Somebody asked me one night, they said, you ever have a dream about her? No, I hadn't. That night, I went to bed. I got home from work, went to a shower, went lay down in bed. Because I get off at like 5.30. I got to be back at work at 3. So I'm like, okay, I got to go sleep. So I'm laying in bed, and I hear stuff moving around the kitchen. And I get up, and I go in the kitchen. And I walk around the corner, and it's her and my kids standing there cooking. It's like, oh, hey, sleepyhead, you got a good nap in? And then she pulls me aside, and I'm like trying to figure out what's going on. She's like, I need your help. And I said, okay. And she looked at me and goes, why are you not doing anything? Why are you just sitting here? And that moment I woke up and I'm like, what in the heck am I doing? See, I keep wanting to do something to honor their memory and like put something through, you know, forward and stuff. And so I just keep talking about it. I do lives every night and I talk about it. I cook. I love to cook. She loved to cook. Well, that's what we bonded over was cooking. Cooking and hunting. That woman could out hunt anybody. I think that's so healthy, man, to, it, to it's, just talk about it like that. It's something. That's for sure. And yeah. Some days I'll start crying in front of people. But man, dealing with the negativity on the internet is insane. Oh man, I know. <laughs> it's so You'll post up. a video and you'll get like 30 people message you and yeah. like 25 of them will be just the hatefulest people you've ever met in your whole life. Yeah. Like these people just would wish you the worst. It's like, well, you're, the worst already happened. So but I'm, then you'll get, <laughs> you'll get four that are just like medium. I'm sorry, I'm sorry man. for your loss. And then you'll get one that's like, Hey, this is my story. And you look at their story and you're like, man, they're still pushing through. But then you'll get yeah. that, you always get that person that's like, you've been through all this and you're still 
moving, and all I did was lost my dad, and I can't function. Like, I need to stop complaining. And I'm like, it's not about complaining. It's not about the pain. Everybody's pain's valid. Everybody's been through trauma. I don't care if you've lost your dad, your uncle, your cousin, your best friend, your your boyfriend of 25 years, your wife, or your entire family. Everybody's Everybody's pain is valid. It doesn't matter who you are. Everybody deserves compassion. And I tell everybody that follows me to reach out to me. If you need to talk, reach out. If I can get to you, I will. And then I had 47,000 messages. Yeah. At that point, I was considering hiring somebody to look through them. But I got through all the important ones. And I learned a lot. There's a lot of people that go through the same things we're going through every day. And I'm sure you get millions of emails. I'm positive. You got to. I I mean, you're so right, though. Like, And it took me a while to learn that, too, guys. Because I was just so mad at everyone. Like, no one's been through what I've been through. And then I... Oh, you hated the whole... And then, oh, I lost my dad. Yeah, I know then, how you feel. And then I learned, like, wow. Like, you're so right. Like, wow, everyone's going through something. Like, we're just not talking about it. But, like, everyone's miserable. <laughs> and I, I think... Dude, I don't let those bad messages get to you, man. Because you're doing so much good. Well, I write it up as this right here. Every day, everybody takes in a bunch of trash. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, your boss jump your butt, all this stuff. And you have to have an outlet for it somewhere. It's easy for me to just click delete. Like, it, it's not a big yeah. deal. I, I'll, I'll read it, and I'll think about it. And I'm like, I wonder what all they've been through in their life. But before this, I'd rip your head off. Yeah. I'm like, I'll be at your house in 10 minutes. Tell me where you live. I was that guy. Like, you know, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not tolerating this. Somebody talk about my wife, I would lose it. Now I'm just like, you know, they're going through something. I think one thing that I'm getting from your, one of the things I've gotten from just talking to you today is your strength to go to the crash site, go see the car, bash the windows out of the car. You're so mad that glass survived. Like this window survived. And like you're just like you're, it is. Oh, I was mad. You were mad. And I think I interviewed this guy, Colin Campbell months ago and he lost his two teenage kids to a drunk driver who's making a turn boom killed and he's like i remember i'm outside of the car and i can see my family and i'm just kind of frozen like i don't know what to do and i hear like someone from the crowd because like a crowd's gathered Mm -hmm. so i heard someone from the crowd like like go see him dad like go go see your kids And, and he's like so i walked up and saw my kids dead and and it didn't, and all this stuff. And I, and then I asked him, like, dude, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't at the car accident with my family. Mm-hmm. And so part of me wishes I was. And then part of me is kind of grateful that I didn't see him. Didn't 10 see out anything. of 10 would not recommend. And he actually told me the other opposite. He's like, he's like, you know what? He's like, I'm glad I saw him. And I think you should try to see everything. And then, like, because li- I chose, the, the doctors told me that, like, you can, you can see Frankie, your daughter. She's not a scratch on her. She looks like an angel. And then they're like, you can't see Courtney or Ace. That they're just, you can't even look at them. That's what they told me. And so I had this weird shame and guilt that I just didn't, I didn't see a lot of the damage and the chaos. And I now, after podcasting, I do think like what you did was the right thing. As awful and as scary and as terrible it is holding your dead daughter for two hours, as terrible as that is, I think it may have given you a lot of closure in a lot of ways you don't even understand yet. And sa- like visiting the crash site, vi- visiting the, the car, I think, because uh, looking at you a year later, and again, we're going to do the comparison thing that we just said not to do, but like, I think you're doing really good, at least just for, I've only known you for two hours, I don't know. But like, like you have energy, you have a smile, you have like, you kind of have some type of happiness. Like, and I think this is just my educated guess, but like, I think a lot of that comes from the hell you put yourself in so early going to work. I couldn't go back to work for a while. Like, I, I, I think there's a lot of courage in what you've done. And I think well, people, I think, I think this is an important part of grief. If you're going through grief, I think this is something to consider is you should see the body. You should go to the crash site. You should talk about it because it's not going away. And if you choose to try to run from it, it's just going to get stronger and stronger well, and worse got, and worse. You only got two options. You can either face it head on or hide, or hide in the dirt. You don't have, I, I call it ostriching. 
you can be an ostrich if you want to be, but you ain't going to get nowhere. Yeah. And you can bury your head in the sand. You can do whatever you want to do. But the problem is, is it ain't going away. I mean, you, I had responsibility. And the Bible says a man takes care of his family. And I had to go back and take care of my family because I still had people that depended on me, regardless of whether I liked it or not. I still had people that depended on me. And I feel guilty as crap for even wanting to end it all. And there's still days where I'm like, I could just, it would be over right now if I just, if I had that courage, and I'm like, it's not courage. It's just a coward way out. It's just sorry, ending the world. <laughs> sorry, I'm smiling, but me and Ryan were in Tennessee yesterday doing mm-hmm. a podcast, and we were going on this walk, and we were walking across this bridge. It was a tall bridge, and I'm like, Ryan, like, it's the, my family's waiting for me right there at the bottom. Like, I just have to just. I will guarantee you this. I just have to topple over this, and I'm home. I'm there. Yep. And it's just like, yeah. I thought that way. I've I know. Been there. That's how you see death now. I was like, they're right there. I'm not scared of it at all. Not see, at all. See, I've always been very brave. Like, I'll walk out in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night by myself. I don't matter. I'll take my side by side and I'll sling it in a corner at 80 mile an hour. It don't bother me. It does yeah. not bother me. But then you got to realize there's got, other people with me and I can't do You got do kids. That. <laughs> yeah, like and kids, man. Here's the bad thing about the whole situation. It's not that it's easy to do it, but if you did it, you'd never see them. So I get this, what if? What if heaven is real, 100%, which I believe it is real, but what if it is real and you're wrong? And it's and people say, oh, it ain't real. We just all get with them. What if you do that and you never see them again? But what if you live a good life and you get to see them again? Yeah. What if you live a life that's worthy of being proud of? I want people to remember my family, and I'm going to do everything yeah. I can do to get people to remember my wife. I want to live a life that reflects my wife yeah. and kids. Because now I'm living their lives. I'm not right. just living my life. I'm doing the things they wanted to do because they wanted to do them too. So I am bringing everything they wanted to do. And I talk about my kid, my wife to my kids all the time. I mention her like she's still here. Because I, to me, yeah. she's still watching us. And my daughter will freak you out. She sees ghosts. And she's, I promise you, she says some, say, says things that you couldn't even picture where she got it from. She'll describe people to you that have been dead for years that nobody's ever met. My daughter will creep you out. <laughs> and my son coming there the other night, so I posted a video about this. I was going to tell you about this earlier. My son doesn't really talk about his mom. But the other night, he comes to the bedroom. He goes, I love you, Mom. I love you. Can you hear me, Mom? Mm. Can you hold me, Mom? And, like, he's reaching into air. And so he takes out her teddy bear, and he's, like, trying to feed it and give it a drink. And he's like, I love my mommy. My mommy, Taylor, is my mommy. And I love my mommy. He's laying down with her, and I am losing it. Aww. I posted a video of this on TikTok. I lost it. Yeah. But I believe it's very... It's healthy to let people see what you're going through, too. Because, like I said before, you don't know what everybody else is going through. There would be people right now that could be watching, that will watch this live that uh, we're doing and go, I'm about to end it all, and then listen to this and go, wow, what they're going through. And I'll be honest with you, when I heard your story, the first time I heard your story was before the wreck. And then the second time I heard it was after the wreck. And before the wreck, I cried for you. After the wreck, I felt for you. Because... I actually heard about your story before I ever heard about you. That was the deal. I heard about that sandstorm, and I heard about the people that were lost in the sandstorm but in that car wreck, and I heard about it. But I never put a face to the name. And there's people that will message me a day and say, hey, I passed that when it happened, and I didn't know that was you. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what good would it have done if you knew it was me, to be honest with you? But I had to stop getting mad at people, though, because that was the biggest thing, is I got mad at people mm. really easy. And I don't know why I even got mad at them. I... I was taking offense to things that shouldn't even have been a problem. Yeah, like with that much grief and trauma, you're just heightened and sensitive to anything, man. It sucks. You're either heightened or sensitive or you're very numb. And to me, I just, I'm at this point in my life, I have no tolerance for anything. If it ain't, if it ain't helping me or benefit my family or my friends in some way, then I'm not interested. Like I have this personality and this, goal in my life to make everybody happy. I want to make everybody happy. I want to please everybody. My wife had the same personality. That's why we mash so well. Like, you got two people together that wanted to make everybody happy. We were a train wreck sometimes. <laughs> and you'll see these people all the time getting divorced over the stupidest things, too. And I've been there. I've been divorced before. And I know you can get divorced over the dumbest things. But now I'm like, you could literally work that out. Like, they're hating each other. And I'm like, you don't understand what it's yeah, like to the, lose that person. The perspective shift that you have when you lose that. Have you been that, told? Uh, have you been told that? Uh, I don't know what you're going through. Me and my husband got divorced last year, and I, I thought that that was he would have been so much easier if he had died or something like that. I've gotten that message before. Yeah, and I lose it on them. Those messages, just like you said, <laughs> like at the beginning, you like just drive me nuts, and now oh. like I think 
I'm sympathetic and I'm and understand somewhat, a little better. I'm more empathetic than sympathetic. I feel you, but there's some things people tell me, and I'm like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I just I don't. Care. I think it, I because with trauma and grief, it's so chaotic up and down. So it kind of just depends. Like what I feel like you're going through. Bit. I feel like you're going through something. You go through divorce. I feel like it. I, I see these people crying. He bought a new truck, and we're divorced. And that new truck was more important than me. And I'm like, who cares? Yeah. Like like seriously, who cares? My wife and kids were killed in a car wreck. I held my daughter while she was dying in my arms. But you, your husband, your ex-husband getting a new truck is not on my radar. Yeah. It is not bothering me at all. Um, so much in common, dude. Uh, we usually end mm-hmm. top three favorite movies. But before we do that, anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up? I'll ask you a question. Yeah, go okay. for it. After it happened. Did you make any big moves quick, or did you make all your moves slow? Very, very, very slow. I bought a new truck one month after she died. I bought two new sides. Dude, you were getting baptized. You were going to church. You were doing. I was just. I don't even remember. I felt like if I stopped, it would all end. It'd be real. If if I stopped moving, it'd be it'd be real. Yeah, I was just. It's like my brain. I think part of my brain is just protecting myself. Like, like Mace, we can't. I'm just worried I'll forget them. We can't grieve this many people, so maybe we just do do it a little bit for one of them today, I tried and then that. we shut it down. Like, and then another part of me is like, no, like we need to feel all. It's just like a constant battle in my own head, and then it you know gets we exhausted. About that when it first started, the whole when you say you're you like you start talking to your wife or something like that, and, and then you, it you feel guilty for not yeah, talking. Yeah, like, oh Frank, and like oh Riggs, and like I haven't thought about my brother in a while. Like that's messed up. Yeah. Ryder, like, yeah. I, I, I got a, like a, there was a thing that was given to my boy. It was like a montage uh, pegboard of all the stuff, you know, from yeah. school. And it's still at the end of my bed. My daughter's bed's still there. All her clothes are on her bed. Her blanket that she was wearing is folded up on her bed. Uh-huh. My wife's Bible's next to it. My son's teddy bear's next to it. I have a real bad habit of not letting things go, which I'm still trying to. I'm trying to get a quilt There's made. It's been a like year, that. man. Be nice to yourself. Well, here's the thing. A year is a long time, though, when you break it down and you think about it. It is a long time. You can do a lot in a year. You can yeah. go from being single to married with a kid on the way and a new house, new dog, new car, new everything, to burying your wife. Does it feel like it's been a year, but it's also been like 20 years? It feels like it's been five minutes. It yeah. feels like it happened yesterday. Yeah. Like, I will sit there and I'll start thinking back, and I'm like, somebody asked me, because I started trying the dating world out, and people ask me, are you sure you're over them? First of all, never gonna be over them. But second of all, they're like, it hadn't been that long. And I'm like, it has two. It's been a, it's been a year and a half. And then you'll start thinking, man, it feels like she could walk through the door right now. Then you're like, ah, then you'll delete the app. And then a couple <laughs> weeks later, you'll add that back. You'll be it's like, I'm done with down. this. It's you'll up add and it down, back. left and right. One minute you'll want companionship real bad. Yep. And the next minute you're like, Get I feel like here. I'm cheating. Like you just I don't yeah, want to do this. There's nothing linear. And consistent about it. It's just a ro- It's up and down. Everything left has and changed, right. and you feel like you're so old too, because you'd be like, the whole dating world has changed. It hasn't been that long, and you're like, I don't understand this. And then people are like, you want to go out and do something? You're like, hey, I got to get dressed for that. I just don't feel like. It. I'd rather go to bed. I'd rather just go to bed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got friends. They'd be like, hey, let's go riding at night, and we'll get some we'll get some beers and stuff like that. And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. And about eight thirty, I'm like, hey man, I ain't coming. <laughs> I'm going to bed. <laughs> that's hilarious that's yeah. me yeah so what's your movies I'll see my, you want my movies I want yours alright well first of all before we do movies like I, I thank you man like oh you're welcome you're, you're a rock star I'm life's brutal I think you're 90% so cool keep doing what you're doing no I'm like 90% an, an idiot but I'm like 10% of the time I know what I'm doing the rest of it I just kind of fumble around in the dark till I figure it out that's everyone though <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, my top three favorite movies. I like the Big Lebowski. Oh, I didn't. I didn't think that was coming. I like No Country for Old Men, which you don't like, which is fine. Teach I, their own. I don't. It's not that I don't like it. It's just different. And I'm gonna go. Uh, I'll get a comedy in. I'm gonna go Wedding Singer. I'll throw a wedding singer in. Adam Sandler. Mine's simple. Never ending story. 
Wait, hold on, hold on. We're going to go three, two, one. So give me your third. My third? Yeah, your third favorite. I'm going to say Back to the Future. Back to the Future? See, when I was a kid, I used to think that, because I grew up in a... Man, well, what if we could go back to the future? God no, no, damn it. I don't, I don't, the thing. When I was a kid, I had a very rough childhood, and I don't ever want to go back there. Like, I don't want to, but I always thought when I was a kid, if I could go back just a little bit more and change who I was born to, I'd be so much happier. Yeah, that's depressing, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was... <laughs> my childhood was a disaster from the get-go to the end. Well, adulthood hasn't and, been uh, any better to you either. You know what? But <laughs> it's not your circumstances. It's how you interact with your circumstances that matters. Life's 10% what happens yeah. to you, 90% what are you going to do It's better. all about personality. You can take all this and turn it into the worst person in the world. Yeah. Or you can be happy and make everybody else happy. And so I'd say number two would be Tombstone. Tombstone's one of the best movies ever filmed, period. Going country or western? It is one of the best movies ever filmed, period. There's never anything else. And then the never-ending story has to be number one. I've never seen a never-ending story. When the horse gets stuck in the bog, you'll start crying. Oh, I want to. I want to see. I want to watch it. The, watch the first one first, and just call me after you watch. It. <laughs> hey, I watched the never-ending story. It's totally different. Cry. So the kid, he's having a rough go at stuff, and he finds this book and he starts reading the story, and it sucks him into the story. And he is the protagonist of the story, so mm. he's having to go through everything as his kid in the story. But he's also the storyteller at the same time. So he's kind of following the situation. And everything he happens, he's starting to realize more and more and more that, you know, he can handle everything on his own. He can do things because the whole story is about this guy. He's trying to save everything and it just ain't going right. And everybody's depending on him. He's like, I don't know what to do. And by the end of the story, he is, I can actually do this. I can actually fix this. It's all me. And that's the best part about the whole story. It's pretty much story of my life. Yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> this is like, this is like you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty strong. Off that side of that, I don't watch anything new. None of the new stuff just looks good, and there's yeah. so much, so much hate in the world. I just don't want to watch it. I don't even want to deal with it. I don't want to be involved in it. I don't want to start liking something and be like, oh, well, this guy did this and this guy did that. So I just don't watch it. Like I, I'm a big YouTube fan. I like to watch a lot of YouTube people. I'm a huge podcast person. One of these days, I want to see if I can get on Bunny's podcast. Who's that? Uh, Jelly Roll's wife. Who? Jelly Roll. Oh, I don't. I don't do pot. I don't know. Sorry. Hey, <laughs> Jelly Roll's a singer, but here's the thing. I didn't know who Taylor Sw- Swifton was or Swift or whatever. I didn't know who she was until the other day. Yeah, she's over. I thought it was Travis Kelsey's wife. That's who I thought. <laughs> well, I, I think thought it she was is. Gold singer, so I didn't know. <laughs> I thought she was I thought I thought she quit singing when she stopped singing country. I just thought she quit singing. I didn't know she was still a thing. Yeah, she should have stopped singing. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't I really didn't know who she was. I really didn't know. Yeah. And everybody's been trying to educate me on her. It's funny that you bring up the podcast because people are like, if you do listen to this pod, I'm like, I, I, there's one podcast I listen to and it's Bill Simmons. It's a NBA basketball yeah, I know who you're talking about. podcast. That's it. That's all. Oh I man. Go, uh, go listen to, Je- uh, Don Hart Jr.'s podcast. Just follow that one. You will learn so much. I'm going to listen to yours. You, I didn't know you started one. I've got a, Should we I got to give you a shout out. Again? No, not yet. Are you like retired? I or? took it down. I yeah. got to put it back up. I had a story that just rocked me to the core. And I just ever since then I hadn't wanted to do it because it just is is horrible. But now my TikTok is where I do everything. Now I just talk on TikTok, and if I do another podcast, I'm gonna post it on TikTok. That's where I'm gonna do that. Well, there you but, go, man. Yeah, but you can share my TikTok if you want to. I don't care. It's I, Kyle B two one one two. Kyle B two one one two two one. One two, yeah. One two. Twenty one twelve. <laughs> twenty one twelve. My boy was born in two thousand twelve, and I met my wife in twenty one. Those are some good numbers for you, then. Mm-hmm. My daughter's is five five uh, five fifteen, and that's kind of my deal. It's five fifteen. So Matthew five fifteen. What uh, about what about tattoos? You you ever nope. think about getting a tattoo? I did. Okay, so I thought about it. So I've always been very much on the whole don't get tattoos, it's biblically, and whatever. Yeah. And my wife didn't have tattoos, and she was against them, so I didn't ever get one. But I wanted to get the interstate with a 75 marker because that's exactly oh. – she died 10 feet from yeah. it, like right beside it. So I wanted to get that, and I've thought about it, and I actually have been looking into tattoo artists, but there's one in Colorado that I like really good. He was on Inked Up, and it was pretty good. Dude, come out of Colorado, and then I'm right there in Utah. You can come hang out. Well, I'm going to Utah – Next year, I'm going to Moab, Utah. Next year, oh, you gotta do the rope swing. Well, I want to take side sides up there because I well, want to do that too. Some of that stuff, and then the rope swing later. If the BLM doesn't close it down before too long, because they're trying to close down everything out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. No the idea. Bureau of Land Management is trying to close down everything. I don't understand it, but 
I like living under a rock. I don't know who these podcasters are. I don't know. Well, be honest with you. I didn't know who a lot of people were on TikTok until the other day. I started kind of running down a rabbit hole. <laughs> there's there's people on TikTok, like this girl at Bellarina Farms or whatever. Somebody said, oh, her husband was ungrateful because she wanted to have this ballerina career and stuff. And I don't think she was. I watched the stories. I think she's happy. But I don't understand why everybody's <laughs> getting, picking so big a fight about all this stuff. I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is just typical relationship stuff. I mean, he seems to be a decent guy. He's a hard worker. He's got eight kids. I mean, if I had eight kids, I probably wouldn't have time to go to Spain or Italy or wherever they wanted to go anyhow. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. I, mean, um, I had six and that was enough. Well, we're thanks for coming on. We're gonna get some barbecue, hopefully, before we we're flying need, out. We're flying home. You need tonight, to find an Uber and go to Nick's. Nick's barbecue. Yeah, it's about twenty five miles from here. You got to go to Nick's. There's no there's no better barbecue in the state of Arkansas. Okay, I'm gonna I'm, gonna I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. There's nobody that are almost famous in Conway. You can't go anywhere else and not get good barbecue. Okay, well, Nick's here we come, and life's ten percent what happens to you, and ninety percent what you're gonna do about it. Mm-hmm.